It's July the 18th. Let's read the Bible. Friends, welcome back to this year-long journey from Genesis to Revelation in just one year. Here we are, middle of July. Hope you're having a wonderful summer. Thank you for joining us in the reading of God's Word today. We just finished the book of Acts. Now we're going to jump back into the Old Testament. We're going to read first the book of Ezra and then the book of Nehemiah. It may interest you to know that originally in the Hebrew Bible, those two books were actually together, Ezra and Nehemiah, the story of the return of the Jews uh, from Babylon, the rebuilding of the temple, the rebuilding of the people, and under Nehemiah, the rebuilding of the walls around the city of Jerusalem. We believe Ezra wrote both of those books. Basically, the book of Ezra covers a period of about 90 years, from about 540 B.C. down to about 450 B.C. It answers the question, how in the world did the Jews get back home from Babylon to Jerusalem? And when they came back to the devastated ruins of the city, what was the situation? How did they begin? And uh, how did God work through them for the rebuilding of the temple? Now, let me give you a very simple outline of the book of Ezra. There are two people. There's Zerubbabel, and then there is Ezra, the man for whom the book is named. Zerubbabel is the man who led the Jews back from Babylon to Jerusalem, and he led in the rebuilding of the temple. So we're going to say the ministry of Zerubbabel is Ezra chapters 1 through 6. The rebuilding of the temple under Zerubbabel, chapters 1 to 6. Then in chapter 7, here comes Ezra. He is going to rise up under God to lead in the spiritual re revival and rebuilding of the people spiritually. So Zerubbabel, chapters 1 through 6, and then Ezra, chapters 7 through 10. Now, um, the other thing we want to say is this book is the story of the faithfulness of God. He promised he would bring his people home. It was necessary that they went into Babylonian captivity it was equally necessary that they would come back home. So we're going to read now Ezra 1, 2, and 3. We're, we're beginning now with chapter 1. And I'm reading chapter 1 from the Christian Standard Bible. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah, the Lord aroused the spirit of King Cyrus. He was the great king over the Persian Empire the spirit of King Cyrus, to issue a proclamation throughout his entire kingdom and to put it in writing. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says, The Lord, the God of the heavens, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you, may his God be with him, and may he go to Jerusalem in Judah and build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. Let every survivor, wherever he resides, be assisted by the men of that region with silver, gold, goods, and livestock, along with a free will offering for the house of God in Jerusalem. So the family heads of Judah and Benjamin, along with the priests and Levites, everyone whose spirit God had roused, prepared to go up and rebuild God's house in Jerusalem. All their neighbors supported them with silver articles, gold, goods, livestock, and valuables, in addition to all that was given as a free will offering. King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and had placed in the house of his gods. King Cyrus of Persia had them brought out under the supervision of Mithridath, the treasurer who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. This was the inventory, 30 golden basins, 1,000 silver basins, 29 silver knives, 30 gold bowls, 410 various silver bowls, and 1,000 other articles. The gold and silver articles totaled 5,400. Shech Bazar brought all of them when the exiles went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. Now, one part of the story that we just have to understand is that uh, God was behind it all. God moved in the heart of a pagan king, King Cyrus. In fact, in, in the book of Isaiah, God calls him my servant Cyrus. It just reminds us of what 
The Bible says that the uh, heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And God put it in the heart of Cyrus to issue this amazing proclamation. And he even put it in the heart of Cyrus to give back to the Jewish people the articles of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar had taken away many years earlier. Remember, Jerusalem, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar comes and he takes away Daniel and the other young men. And he also loots out of the temple in 605 BC, gold and silver implements, goblets and so on. Nebuchadnezzar takes them back to Babylon, puts them in the temple of his God or his gods in Babylon. And there they are until many years later, about 539, 538 BC, Cyrus says to the Jews, you can go back to Jerusalem and guess what? I'm going to give you back the gold and silver implements that were taken from you. Now, what we have in Ezra chapter 2 is a list of those Jews by family who returns it's about 50,000 who came back. I'm, I have made here an editorial decision. This is a long list of names. It's, a, it's like the genealogy of First Chronicles, and I've made an editorial decision. I find it difficult to read all these names from the, in the way that the Christian Standard Bible has it, so I have decided to read Ezra chapter 2 from the Berean Study Bible, which is, that's not well known, but it's a newer version. I think it's very well done. And I'm going to be reading just this chapter from the Berean Study Bible. We'll go back to the CSB in Ezra chapter 3. Now, these are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles carried away to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, its king. They returned to Jerusalem and Judea, each to his own town, accompanied by Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Realiah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpar, Bigvi, Rehum, and Bayanah. This is the count of the men of Israel, the descendants of Parash, 2172, the descendants of Shephatiah, 372, the descendants of Arah, 775, the descendants of Pahath Moab, through the line of Jeshua and Joab, 2812, the descendants of Elam, 1254, the descendants of Zatu, 945, the descendants of Zakai, 960, the descendants of Bani, 642, the descendants of Bebai, 623, the descendants of Asgad, 1222, the descendants of Adonikam, 666, the descendants of Bigvi, 2056, the descendants of Aden, 454, the descendants of Achur, through Hezekiah, 98, the descendants of Bezai, 323, the descendants of Jorah, 112, the descendants of Hashem, 223, the descendants of Gibar, 95, the men of Bethlehem, 123, the men of Netopha, 56, the men of Anathoth, 128, the descendants of Asmaveth, 42, the men of Kiriath, Jerim, uh, Chephira, and Beirah, 743, the men of Ramah and Geba, 621, the men of Michmash, 122, the men of Bethel, Ai, 223, the descendants of Nebo, 52, the descendants of Magbish, 156, the descendants of the other Elam, 1254, the descendants of Harim, 320, the men of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 725, the men of Jericho, 345, the descendants of Sinaa, 3630, the priests, the descendants of Jediah, through the house of Jeshua, 973, the descendants of Emer, uh, 1052, the descendants of Pasher, 1247, the descendants of Harim, 1017, the Levites, the descendants of Jeshua and Cadmiel, through the line of Hodaviah, 74, the singers, the descendants of Asaph, 128, the gatekeepers, the descendants of Shalom, the descendants of Atir, the descendants of Talmud, the descendants of Akub, the descendants of Hatita, and the descendants of Shobai, 139 in all, the temple servants, the descendants of Ziha, the descendants of Hasufa, the descendants of Tabaat, the descendants of Kirath, the descendants of Siaha, the descendants of Padon, the descendants of Libanah, the descendants of Hagaba, the descendants of Aku, the descendants of Hagab, the descendants of Shalmai, the descendants of Hanan, the descendants of Gidi, the descendants of Gehar, the descendants of Ria'a, the descendants of Reason, the descendants of Mikoda, the descendants of Gazan, the descendants of Uzzah, the descendants of Pasia, the descendants of Besai, the descendants of Asna, the descendants of Munim, the descendants of Nefushim, 
the descendants of Bakbuk, the descendants of Hakufa, the descendants of Harher, the descendants of Baslu, the descendants of Mahida, the descendants of Harsha, the descendants of Barkas, the descendants of Sisera, the descendants of Teman, the descendants of Mazia, the descendants of Hatifa, the descendants of the servants of Solomon, the descendants of Sotai, the descendants of Sophereth, the descendants of Peruda, the descendants of Jaelot, the descendants of Darkon, the descendants of Giddel, the descendants of Shephatiah, the descendants of Hatil, the descendants of Pokereth, Hazabahim, the descendants of Amy, the temple servants, and the descendants of the servants of Solomon, numbered 392 and all. The following came up from Telmila, Telharsha, Chirab, Anan, and Emmer, but could not prove that their families were descendants from Israel, the descendants of Delaah, the descendants of Tobiah, the descendants of Nakoda, 652 and all, and from among the priests, the descendants of Hobiah, the descendants of Hakaz, the descendants of Barzillai, who had married a daughter of Barzillai the Gileadite and was called by their name. These men searched for their family records, but they could not find them, so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor ordered them not to eat the most holy things until there was a priest to consult the Urim and Thummim. The whole assembly numbered 42,360, in addition to their 7,337 men servants and maid servants, as well as their 200 male and female singers. They had 736 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels, and 6720, 6,720 donkeys. When they arrived at the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, some of the heads of the families gave free will offerings to rebuild the house of God on its original site. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury for this work 61,000 derricks of gold, 5,000 minas of silver, and 100 priestly garments. So the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants, along with some of the people, settled in their own towns, and the rest of the Israelites settled in their town. Now, Ezra chapter 3, Ezra chapter 3, and I'm going back now to the Christian Standard Bible. That was a long list in Ezra 2. Now, pay attention. In just about three or four days, we're going to come to Nehemiah 7. And what do you know? Nehemiah 7 is an almost identical listing of the people who came back. It's almost identical, but it's not quite. Well, what we need to know is there were about 50,000 people came back and they counted them very carefully. The Jews, you know, they were, they were sticklers for this kind of detail down to counting the camels and counting the donkeys and, and, and all the rest of it. So now, in by the miraculous hand of God, through the proclamation of King Cyrus, God's people have come home. After all that we read about in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, God's people are home at last. They're back home, but the land that they left and the land they came back to, it's Israel, but they are now completely under Gentile domination. They are, they are completely at the mercy of all the great kingdoms and nations and all the armies around them. And they came back to a city that had been burned, destroyed, looted, broken down, and where once had stood the great temple of Solomon, one of the wonders of the ancient world, nothing was left. Nothing but just some foundation stones, everything else destroyed. And you understand, don't you? And we'll get into this more with Nehemiah, but you understand that, that in the ancient world, when the walls were torn down, the city had no defense. A city with no walls had no defenses. It, it was just right for the pickings. And so bad guys could come in any time they wanted. And for 70 years, they had done that. So now, now they're back. What's going to happen? Ezra 3, when the seventh month arrived and the Israelites were in their towns, the people gathered as one in Jerusalem, Jeshua, son of Jozadak, and his brothers, the priests, along with Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and his brothers began to build the altar of Israel's God in order to offer burnt offerings on it as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set up the altar on its foundation and offered burnt offerings for the morning and evening on it to the Lord, even though they feared the surrounding peoples. They celebrated the festival of shelters as prescribed 
and offer burnt offerings each day based on the number specified by the ordinance for each festival day. After that, they offered the regular burnt offering and the offerings for the beginnings of each month and for all the Lord's appointed holy occasions, as well as the free will offerings brought to the Lord. On the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, even though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. They gave money to the stone cutters and artisans and gave food and drink and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre so they would bring cedar wood from Lebanon to Joppa by sea, according to the authorization given to them by King Cyrus of Persia. God, God has done something. This is, this is what it looks like when God has done something. They come into the wasteland. They come into the virtual desert of what had been the, the nothing but rubble to like, a, you know, Berlin after World War II. I mean, just nothing. Just destru- destruction everywhere. They, they came in. In the midst of the destruction, they began to, they set up the altar and followed the word of God and began to offer the sacrifices. That's how determined that even though they were, they were, they were terrified by the pagans who were now in control of everything. So here's what's going to happen. Verse 8, in the second month of the second year, after they arrived at God's house in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Jeshua, son of Jozadak, and the rest of their brothers, including the priests, the Levites, and all who returned to Jerusalem from the captivity, began to build. They appointed the Levites, who were 20 years old or more, to supervise the work on the Lord's house. Jeshua with his sons and brothers, Cadmiel with his sons and the sons of Judah, and of Hinnadad with their sons and brothers, the Levites joined together to supervise those working on the house of God. When the builders had laid the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests dressed in their robes and holding trumpets, and the Levites descended from Asaph, holding cymbals, took their positions to praise the Lord as King David of Israel had instructed. They sang with praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love to Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the Lord's house had been laid. But many of the older priests, Levites and family heads, who had seen the first temple, wept loudly when they saw the foundation of this temple but many others shouted joyfully. The people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shouting from that of the weeping because the people were shouting so loudly and the sound was heard far away. That last part, the last part, the older priest. You, you gotta, we got to remember now you're at uh, 536, maybe 535, something like that. So it has been, it has been 70 years since the first deportation, 605 B.C. 70 years has passed. It's been 50 years since the temple was destroyed. And these older priests, what are we talking about here? We're talking about young men who in 586 B.C. would have been 20 or maybe 30 years old now by definition. Now, they're at least 70, they're 75, they're 80, they're 85. They look back and they see the glory of Solomon. It's in their mind and they see this little, this little, this, th- this temple that's going to be built is just going to be a shadow. This is going to be a small thing. It's going to be a double wide compared to the Taj Mahal of, uh, of, Solomon's day. So they wept when they remembered what they had lost. But everybody else, the younger generation, were going, thanks be to God. This may be just a little double wide, but it is for the glory of God. It's not wrong to look back, friends. We ought to look back. We ought to remember. And especially, I think it's wise to look back and remember and ponder what we have lost. Perhaps what we have lost because of our own foolishness, disobedience, and wrong choices. But we ought to rejoice with the tiniest little evidence of the blessing of God. Though God's work should start small, 
we're going we, later on it's going to take us a while we're going to get down to the book of zechariah near the end of the old testament so you got to stick around to the end of the year but zechariah is going to he's going to address that very problem though it starts small god has big plans big big plans for what he's going to do so yes we have to look back but are you glad are you glad when somebody comes to jesus are you glad when a prodigal comes back do you rejoice when a prayer is answered that has been prayed for a long long time i know i know it's easy to look back and 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 be sad over what was lost and that's not wrong but even better to rejoice at the smallest evidence of the goodness and grace of god and so go out and rejoice today keep your eyes open god's at work you're going to see the seeds and signs of God's grace all around you today. Lord, give us eyes to see what you're doing and help us to rejoice in that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, that's the beginning of the book of, of Ezra. They're off to a good start, but it's not going to last very long. we got trouble coming right around the corner. Come back tomorrow. We'll talk about it. See you then.